Father, thank you for this day. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you for who you are and what you mean to us. God, I thank you for your word. Your word is always right. It is yes, it is amen. And so God, just be with our Bible study tonight. God, I thank you for those who come out in our midweek service. And God, we just truly want to worship you and we want to learn and we just want to be challenged from your word. So God, I thank you that you uh, give us your word. I thank you that uh, your word is always true. And God, I pray you just be with our Bible study tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I'll be, uh, we'll be looking in verse 24 through 28. And tonight I want to talk to you about a true disciple. A true disciple. And let me give you the outline uh, as we get started tonight. Number one, a true disciple must deny himself. A true disciple must deny himself. Number two, a true disciple must count the cost. Must count the cost. And number three, a true disciple must be given an account to God, must give an account to God. And we will see all this in Scripture. There are handouts out there. I, I, as many times as I can, I try to have those out. If you want a handout, please go ahead and uh, pick those up. Anybody need a handout? Ted's there in the back. Anybody, if you'll just slip it, okay. All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, when Jesus first started his public ministry, he was looking for some men uh, that, that could help him in his ministry. Uh, to the 12, he called, he gave a simple command when he talked to him the first time, two words, follow me. We use the term many times that Christians are followers of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' days, many followed Jesus because of his miracles but that did not necessarily mean they were believers. But there, but there were others who followed Jesus more, more closely, and you knew that they were Christians. My point tonight is that to take another step of faith in your Christian walk, you have to totally surrender everything you are in order to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And it says, let's look at these wonderful truths uh, that Jesus taught his own disciples. So we see this first part, and, and again, we're talking about Christians here. I'm not saying that followers are not Christians. I'm saying uh, some were and some what. You know, when he fed the 5,000, you know, they were looking, uh, a lot of them were looking for the food. And when you put food out, I'm telling you, people will come. But you have to understand there were a lot of people that followed Jesus, and they were simply followers, okay? And then he took these 12 men, and he, uh, you know, poured into their life, and they became disciples. So we see here, they must surrender all. That's what it says. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. And basically, denying yourself is saying it's never been about me, okay? My relationship with Jesus Christ, it's all about him. And folks, it's so important that we deny ourselves in all areas of our lives, not just a few areas. And a lot of Christians do this. They pick and choose what they want to deny and what they don't want to deny or what they want to give up and what they don't want to give up. And he's just saying the first thing we have to do is deny himself. And the second thing it says there, and take up his cross, okay? Uh, there's many explanations given for take up his cross, but I believe what he is talking about is you must be willing to suffer, okay? You must be willing to suffer uh, in taking up your cross. Matter of fact, 
Jesus set the perfect example of suffering. Okay, he went to the cross and he died on the cross. And even in death, folks, part of denying yourself is, is dying to self, dying to self. And if you're like me, uh, you know, you, you do it and, you know, even mentally and emotionally and, you know, even spiritually sometimes we die to self. But that has to be a continual process in your life. So we must deny ourselves, take up the cross, and follow me. And, and folks, I'm not saying, you know, that, that you know, follow me is, is something that we should take lightly. When we talk about following Jesus, you think about his disciples. For two and a half, almost three years, they, they followed Jesus everywhere he went. And you think about it, they left their families, they left their friends, and they left their business, okay? You know, two-thirds of them were fishermen, and they literally left all these to follow Jesus. And I'm telling you, the best thing that we can do in our personal lives is to follow Jesus. I mean, he, he will never lead you down the wrong road. He will never lead you astray. Uh, and, and when we follow Jesus, it, it, it really shows that we are serious about our walk with Christ. I can't even associate these two words that I have read in books. And here's what it says, casual Christians. Man, I have a hard time with that. God doesn't need casual Christians in their lives. He needs people that are sold out to him. And it's, it's, it's total surrender. It's surrendering everything. You know, and we see surrender as a negative term. And in a lot of ways, in war, obviously it is. But when we talk about following Jesus Christ, surrender is the beginning of that. We have to surrender everything that we are to him. We have to give him everything. He doesn't want leftovers. He wants us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow him. Mark chapter 8. Look at Mark chapter 8 with me. Mark chapter 8. Just Mark, Mark 8. I'll get there here in a second. Mark 8 verse 34. And when he called the people to himself with his disciples also. And you'll notice Jesus in the gospel, there were times that he preached to the masses, and there were times that he preached just to the disciples. And it says, and he called the people to himself with his disciples also, and he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever, whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. To a normal person, to a non-believer, this makes no sense whatsoever. How can I save my life by losing it? Okay, it, it just doesn't compute to them. But when you come to Christ, it's like saying, I'm all in. Okay, I'm not giving you, you know, a third of me. I'm not giving you even three-fourths of me. All right? You have to lose your life. You lose it in him. You lose uh, your way of thinking, okay? You lose your wants and, your, and, and the things that you want and, and, and things that God probably doesn't want in your life. So he has this, and then verse 36, very important, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? I got news for you, folks. We'll see just in point number three, everyone's going to stand before God. And the most important decision you'll ever make in your life is not just to follow Jesus, but to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Losing, losing yourself. For who, whoever is ashamed of me in my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed and when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. And really, I, I got to thinking about this. You think of a public profession of faith. 
That's what they're talking about here, okay? God asks us to be witnesses for him. God asks us to come forward, you know, public profession of faith. And, and that's what he's saying here. He's saying, because, and, and I understand, folks, there are people that are shy. I understand that part. But if you are all in, okay, if you're going to be a disciple of Christ, because I'll tell you what the other thing I don't, the word that I don't like, secret disciple. Well, folks, if I'm a, if I'm a true believer, if I am sold out to Christ and I'm a disciple, I can't be a secret one. I don't want to be a secret one. I want everyone to know about my Jesus. I want to talk, talk, to, talk about him in everything I do. And then the next one, uh, Matthew 6, Steve picked this out. and I mean, we just sang this verse, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first. Oh, man, that's, that's the key right there, folks. Seek first. It's not a thing of being first, Okay. Because later on, if you think about it in the Gospels, he said those who were first will be last and those who are last will be first. Again, a concept that the world does not understand, but seek ye first. The first thing you need to do in your life is seek the kingdom of God. To sell out to him, to, to give everything to him, to put him first in your life. And the second part of that is, and his righteousness. Folks, there is nothing righteous about our flesh. When we don't, when we haven't, when we haven't accepted Christ, I'm telling you, we are in our sin. And what we do is we seek the righteousness of God in our life. If there is anything good in my life, it's because God put it there. If there's anything that that I do for the Lord, it's because the Holy Spirit prompts me to do those things. And that's what it's talking about righteousness. And all these things, think about it. What does the word all mean? That's all encompassing. If you will put God first in your life, everything will work out in your life. Because, you know, uh, again, he's not looking, you know, to occupy part of your life. He wants all of your life. And that's what he's saying here. All these things, everything, folks, and and you'll see it here in just a minute. Family, he wants your family first. He wants your family, uh, you know, you, you know, God first, and then your family. Okay, jobs, all these, whatever is going on in your life, he'll work those. And I don't, and I'm not saying everything will be good all the time. I mean, people get sick, people have cancer, people have to have surgeries. It's simply saying that if you will put God first, he'll work out everything else in your life. So we must, we must, we must deny ourselves. The second thing, we must count the cost. We must count the cost. Look back in that Matthew 16, Matthew 16, verse 26. For what profit is it for a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Notice the word profit. Man, everybody wants to make a profit. If you are in a business, you want a profit, okay? So what he is saying is you can make all the money in the world, but if you die without Christ, you lose. You lose. And folks, I'm telling you, I'll tell you exactly what's wrong with our world, okay? It's not, I I mean, I understand evil is present. I understand Satan is running rampant right now. But there are many, many lost people in our world that need Jesus Christ. I'm telling you the answer to all of our problems that we have in life. All, I mean, you can start with politics and you can just go down the list. Man, if these folks would get saved, if they would, uh, you know, realize that, hey, it's not my life. When I invited Christ into my life, I surrendered everything that I have. And I'm telling you, that's what he's saying. Uh, Gain the whole world and lose his soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Folks, there's been many a person that has sold their soul, just sold it out. Okay, sometimes uh, it's it's to a business. Sometimes it's it's to you know uh, you know a cheating spouse that that 
they know better than what they're doing, but I am telling you, they 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 just they just you know decided this this is more important or this is what I want to do with my life. And folks, we can't exchange that. We have to understand when we get saved, we surrender everything to God. Everything that I have is God's. Everything that I will become is God's. It's all God. And it's so important that we understand that. Uh, and, and many people live for worldly pleasures. You know, they're just thinking, man, you know, I, I want to go for the gusto. I want to live the high life. I want to do these things. But yet, many times when you talk to them, even folks, millionaires, can be miserable with their money. And, and here, it's just saying that when you really get to counting the cost, folks, I promise you, when you die and you stand before God, and when you take your first step in heaven, you will say this, it was worth it all. And I, I, I don't care if I have to give everything up. And again, you go back to the biblical times of what the disciples gave up. You think about Paul and everything he gave up. Folks, he was well-educated. He was a tent maker. He, he knew how to make money. He was a, a good speaker. He had, he had power before he got saved. And he gave, he gave all that up, okay, for the cause of Jesus Christ. So we must count the cost. Hold your finger there and go to Luke chapter 14. Luke 14, verse 25. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, yes, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You know something that I've studied especially in the Gospels, the closer Jesus got to the cross, the fewer people followed him. Think about that. The closer. At first, it was the masses. But when you start making statements like this, I'm telling you, after that day, there were people that turned and walked away and says, man, if he really meant that, I don't want anything to do with this. Okay? Because Folks, again, God's not looking for casual Christians. He's looking for disciples. He's looking for folks that will spend time with Him, that are in love with Him, that knows who He is, that loves the Word of God, that, that don't have to tell people. They don't have to walk in a room and tell them, hey, did y'all know I was a Christian? Folks, I ought to be able to walk into a room and somebody know it without me saying I don't walk into a room and say, hey, do you know I'm a preacher? All right? It, ha it happens to me, folks. Third time it happened, uh, Chuck, we were talking about a, a certain person, and they were outside a store, and I walk in there, and she looked at me, and she goes, you're a preacher. And I didn't have my preaching clothes on, <laughs> okay? Folks, there's something about people that are true disciples there's something about their face, okay? And I understand you can't glow all the time, but we need to be glowing and we need to be growing Christians, folks. I'm telling people ought to see the love of Christ in your face. Your face tells a lot, okay? So did Jesus really mean, hey, I need to hate my dad? No, I don't need to hate my dad. I don't need to hate my family. I need to put God before my dad, and before my family. It's always bugged me because my dad and mom live uh, 283 miles from my house. Uh, and I just, you know, there was times I just wanted to jump in the car and go, and I couldn't do that. And I wasn't present when my mother died, and I wasn't present when my father died. And I really beat myself up over that for a while. And here's what he told me. He said, you were doing what I called you to do. And I'll be honest with you, folks, I never even had this verse in mind. Never even thought of this verse. But it was ministry. One time I was in revival, and I said, I'm going to finish the revival tonight, and I'll be there in the morning. I was traveling on the way there for my dad's funeral, and he died before I got there. And folks, that's what he said. No, you don't have to hate your family. 
but God has to be first in your life. He says he cannot be my disciple. Verse 27, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Three times, three scriptures we've read, he's talking about bearing the cross. Okay, no, we're not going to die on a cross. He's not asking you to die on a cross. Matter of fact, dying for Christ is easy compared to living for Christ. Now chew on that. Folks, anybody can die for Christ. But I'm telling you, he wants us to live for him. Verse 28, for which of you intend to build a tower as not sit down first and count the cost where he has enough to finish it, lest after he laid the foundation, he is not able to finish and all who uh, sees it begins to mock him. I'm not going to Paul Walker and I'm not going to say I want a house. And here's what I want in my house. And we never discuss how much this house is going to be. It makes no sense whatsoever. Okay, what he is basically saying, the deal before you even get to the house is you don't worry about these things, okay? You don't, you, you, you know, as far as is, is the exact amount, but, but what he's basically saying, it, it's really not a thing of how much it is. It's simply saying here on this is, hey, it cost Jesus everything. He wants our lives. He wants all of us. Verse 30, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down and first consider whether he's able uh, with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him 20,000. Or uh, while the other is still great way off, he sends a delegation who asks conditions of peace. And he said it again in verse 33. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, cannot be my disciple. So we must count the cost. And when I think of that, think about the rich young ruler. Think about that conversation that, they, that he had with Jesus. He listed some things, and he said, have you done this? Yes. Have you done this? Yes. He checked all the boxes. And then what did Jesus say to him? Talking about, costing and counting the cost. What did Jesus say? Go and sell everything you have and come and follow me. I'm paraphrasing here, but you know what this guy did? He said, mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. I did all these things. I did all these things, but I can't do that. What was, what was the price? Man, he, that's a high price. That was a high price. Okay, rich young ruler, and there's no indication that he ever accepted Jesus Christ into his life. So we must deny ourselves. We must count the cost. And number three, we must give an account to God. Look at those last two verses back in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels and then he will reward each according to his work. Okay? Folks, our sin was judged on the cross. When we stand before God, it's not a deal of sin. Okay? Our sins was nailed to the cross. His blood paid for our sins. He's talking about rewards here. Rewards. Okay? Works. Basically, what have we done? For Jesus. Now you can be a good person and do some good things, but again, that doesn't mean you're saved. Okay? And then he says in verse 20, assuredly, which in other, you know, translation, that means, you know, verily, verily, I say unto you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Folks, I'm telling you, as we spoke about it Sunday night, I believe the rapture of the church is coming. I really do. And I believe, uh, you know, when that day comes, it is going to be the best day of your life. And I, I've heard Christians say this, man, I just, I don't want to stand before God. I, I, man, I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know, I don't know what I'm going to say. And they have this. And I even heard an evangelist in Oklahoma said, 
Here's what he said at Cameron Baptist Church. He said, your life from the time you're saved is going to be on a screen and everybody's going to watch what you had done. And folks, I, you know, I'm not a Bible scholar, but I, I see no basis of that opinion anywhere. Okay, Jesus paid for my sin. Everything that happens uh, will be uh, uh, due towards rewards. 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5.10. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether it be good or bad. Good or bad. And those are the rewards that we are given. Luke chapter, Luke, Luke chapter 18. Luke 18. Luke 18, 28. And Peter, is, and Peter said, See, we have left all and followed you. So he said unto them, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God. Now look at verse 30, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. What is he saying? Folks, we may not receive our rewards here like, but I am telling you, you think about this. I am more blessed. I have more blessings because I am saved, because I am a, a disciple of Jesus Christ. And this is, this is what I love about it. You know, we talk about this phrase, your cake and eat it too. Well, folks, our cake is living here. Our cake is, and, and you think about it, folks, we're not living in a third world country. We don't wake up looking for firewood and looking for food. Okay, I've been in countries like that. I've seen how they live. We are blessed right now. God blesses us right now. And the problem with some Christians is they spend too much time thinking about the things they don't have and not enough time thanking God for the things that they do have. So he's saying, hey, you're going to have a twofold blessing if you will be my disciple. Number one, you're going to be blessed right here. Uh, you know, I mean, none of us walk to church. There's heat and air in our houses. Folks, we can just go on and on about the blessings of God. But not only that, but in, uh, I love this, receive many times more in this present time and in the age of eternal life. Think about that. What do we get? We get heaven. What do we get in heaven? No sin. Man, that alone is worth the trip. That alone is worth the trip. But it's not just that, folks. It's streets of gold. It's trees of life. It's crystal clear water. It's seeing and praising God. All these things we get. Okay? I promise you, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. All right. If I was any kind of singer now, I would bust out in that very chorus. All right. It will be worth it all. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 3, talking about rewards. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Folks, it's all about Jesus. Our whole lives, everything that we are, everything that we believe, everything that we have become, every blessing in our life is about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And it says, now that if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, he lists three things there. And folks, these are the good rewards. These are things that you do for the cause of Christ. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us if you give a cold cup of water in Jesus' name, you're going to receive a reward. And again, it's not so we can stack it up and see, well, my, my reward pile is bigger than your reward pile. Now, that's not what Revelation talks about. 
I believe with all my heart we will take our rewards and we will lay them at the feet of Jesus. Because we wouldn't have a, a reward without Jesus. We're going to give them to Him. And these are the, the things that we do. Anything done in God's name. And you know what we need to be doing? We need, to, we need to be making heavenly deposits every day of our lives. Invite somebody to church. Cha-ching! Win somebody to Christ. Cha-ching! Man, we're just depositing those rewards for Christ. And then it says, uh, the second part of it is wood, hay, and straw. These are the things you did for yourself or, you know, uh, you know to be seen by men, to be known by men, okay? but it doesn't have anything to do with the kingdom of God. And look what it says. It says each one's work will become clear. There's no doubt, okay? Jesus himself will be there. And it says, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. What happens when you put fire to gold and silver? It becomes even more pure. What happens if you put fire to wood, hay, and straw? It burns up. Okay? Just burns up. And it says, if anyone's work which has been built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Yet so is though by fire. Well, folks, I just truly believe that we should desire, yes, Yes, we are followers of Christ. I understand that if we're saved. But we need to be more than just followers of Christ. We need to be disciples of Christ. We need to long for Him uh, you know, to be an intricate part of our lives. We need to wake up thinking about Jesus. We need to go to bed thinking about Jesus. We need to confess our sins every day. We need to pray. We need to witness. We need to teach. We need to serve. Okay? I mean, Jesus said that many, many times. Who's the most important one in the room? It's not the king, folks. It's those people who will serve. Father, thank you for this word. And God, it was your word, man. That's that's red letter stuff. And God, I thank you that you uh, you didn't mince words. And it's not easy. What you are asking what you ask and what we read to, to hate your mother, hate your dad. And, and again, it doesn't mean hate them literally, but to, to put you first in every area of our lives. God, I think of our children and our grandchildren. God, they're just on loan to us. Okay, they're, they're not really ours. They're yours. God, I want to pray for the salvation of our children and of our grandchildren. And God, I pray that we as Christians, that they would see our walk and they would see how we're sold out and they would see how we're surrendered to you. And God, I pray that they would just, uh, you know, and, and get them in church and, man, be reading the Bible to them. Lord, I just pray as they look towards that, you know, day of accountability where they, where they really understand what, what sin is and where they really understand what you've done for them, that they could be saved. And God, I just thank you that, uh, Lord, you counted the cost. You left a perfect place. You came down. You suffered on the cross. And you died for our sins. And God, I thank you that one day, man, we're going to see you again. One day, uh, you're going to give us our rewards. One day, uh, God, we're we're just going to, uh, fellowship, we're going to sing, we're going to praise, and we're going to live with you forever and ever and ever. God, I truly believe with all my heart it's going to be worth it all. It'll be worth it all. So, God, until then, God, if there's any area of our life, if we've kind of gave gave it away and then kind of took it back, or if you're convicting us tonight of anything, Lord, I pray that we would lay that on the altar, Lord. And God, I pray that we would give it back to you, God. Everything that we are is because of you. And God, I pray that we would all have that desire in our lives to be a true 
disciple of Jesus Christ. Thank you for those who have went before us. Thank you for the example of the Word of God. God, I just pray you bless those who are here tonight. And God, I pray you bless their families and, and especially their walk with you. God, I pray that, uh, Lord, if those fires have kind of calmed down, that you would just stir those coals. And God, I pray you would reignite uh, the power of the Holy Spirit in our own life. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.